Yeah. So finish the first milestone for, for the clicker. Um, okay, so um, this is today you can see part of the rules team. Um, this is Fago, the creator of the rules module. Uh, Klausi, the co-maintainer. Uh, I do kind of organizing around the, the initiative that we have. And there's also Fubi helping out with development, Steve Perkis, and Nico Greenau did the great new logo for the rules initiative. Um, what is the rules module? So hands up, who has been using rules in the previous versions? Cool, awesome. Who has not been using rules before? Okay, cool, thanks for showing up still. Um, so the rules module consists of very basic principles. We have any event that can happen on the website. It could be a user interaction, it could be a cron job running in the background. So the event is the trigger that fires. And then um, we can test for arbitrary conditions. So we can check in that case, for example, the user has generated the content has been updated event. And then up here, um, we can check for a condition. So, if, so in this example, um, if the content author is different to the acting user, but it could be any condition that you can think of. And then we can execute actions. Could be one action, could be multiple actions. In that case, we want to notify the content author that another user has changed the content on the website. So based on the principles, events, conditions, and actions, you being a site builder or you being a developer um, can implement very custom workflows. And there's a couple of examples for that. So um, the rules module is, is being used to build flexible workflows. For example, customized mail notifications. So instead of having a backender ne needing to implement the mails that are being sent out through the user interface via, cust uh, via clicking together the rules configuration, you can customize the text that are sent out. Um, or there, you can also do custom redirects, system messages, a lot of other stuff. Um, but the big power of the rules module is um, because um, <clears throat> there's hundreds of integration modules available. So um, we have a big ecosystem. There are entity API, the fields, uh, the views modules. They all have integrations with the rules module. Um, and this is why, uh, actually, yesterday we checked. It's not. It's, we have always been talking about this used on every fifth Drupal site, but it's already used on every fourth Drupal site. So more than 25% of all the Drupal installations use the rules module, um, Yeah, which is kind of cool. So it's maybe not the, the hard requirement for, for people building websites, but it's, it has a very big adoption based on the big flexibility that the rules module provides. Um, yeah. You probably know that already. Um, and this talk is primarily about Drupal 8. So um, we got really excited about Drupal 8, and um, I'm just very quickly recapping that well, there's, there's all of Drupal 8 will be object-oriented. Um, we can have more modern web patterns, uh, development patterns like dependency injection. A lot of APIs get better for Drupal 8. Um, everything is we can do m more efficient testing with the PHP unit framework that is in place. Um, and Drupal 8 uses a lot of Symfony components. Um, so that gave us a lot of motivation uh, to port the rules module to Drupal 8. Also that there's some legacy modules being removed. Web services are part of Drupal core now. Um, and the uh, front end is responsive and so forth. So yeah, we kind of had a lot of general excitement for Drupal 8 and when breaking it down to what is relevant for rules itself. Um, actually, this, this, sorry, just a second. It's a bit weird because the slides are very small here on the screen. <laughs> um, okay, so in Drupal 7 and the versions before, rules was already, I'd say, leveraging best practices coding standards, and it was already organized in a very modular and extensible way. Uh, so actually, rules before already leveraged its own plugins uh, system, but now we can use the plugin system from Drupal 8, which is kind of cool and makes the, the code very uh, much more readable and understandable. 
Um, there's a conditions API in Drupal core, so we can leverage that, and we can also build on all the structured data that is now much more consistently available through APIs. So the entity API now is a, is a full leveraged API in Drupal 8, and the type data API has been uh, made generic again, um, which is kind of cool. Um, the actions API, um, we have to put it in parent, um, um, yeah, we kind of had to fork it because uh, we couldn't fix everything in Drupal core itself, um, but we are building upon the, the existing actions API, um, and maybe in further Drupal 8 point releases, we will be able to, to push that code back into Drupal core itself. Um, then the context API, this is kind of exciting because there's already a Drupal 8 contrib module that joined forces with us, page manager, uh, is using the same context system as the rules module does in order to pass in information into different components of rules and return the structured uh, and metadata annotated information about which contexts are required and what are the return values of the actions performed. Um, yeah, and then in general, configuration management. So instead of implementing our own export system, uh, site, site builders or developers will be able to just use the CMI system in order to export configuration into YAML files, um, which is great. In, we kind of try to, to do it the best way as we can. So reusable components is a big topic for us. So everything, every problem that we solve, we try to solve in a, in a generic way. And we have been talking about this R tools idea a bit. Um, so th the idea is that we, for example, the tokens that rules needs, they, they are its own component. Um, the typed data widgets in order to configure rules and to display rules configurations, um, that should be a reusable part. And then the, yeah, as mentioned, the context API that we're using, it can, it's extended in rules and could be used by other modules. Um, and we also want to have more integratability so that, for example, um, on the block, con like when you have block visibility conditions, um, that could just be a rules UI component where you don't have to go into the rules module itself to configure it, but you, it would just show up in another place and could be reused. Um, so a big focus on reusable UI components. And as you maybe um, already know from the previous versions, the data selector it's kind of handy, it's kind of cool to be able to drill into the, all the data structures available. And this doesn't have to be necessarily part of the rules module. Um, so we implement it in a way that other people can reuse it and uh, probably will, it will just be its own library or its own feature along the way. Right, um, for site builders, um, I think the biggest the biggest change would be the inline rule system that we envision. So instead of um, <clears throat> having to build rules configurations bottom up, where you first define the rules components and then you assemble them together in, in a reaction rule, you would be able to build it top down because that's like the way we think about logic. So uh, when I have to implement more complex if and else um, statements, for example. In Drupal 7, I have to install the rules conditional module or I have to really think bottom up by creating the components first. Whereas with the inline rules system, we envision that site builders would be able to build the structure uh, top down. Um, yeah, deployable configuration as mentioned via CMI. So um, that's like a lot of good things. Um, that we all would like to use right now, right? Um, and Fago and me, over a year ago, we decided it's not gonna happen unless something is pushing us forward. So <clears throat> I'm quickly gonna explain what we did so far. There's a campaign um, which, is, which goes by the name D8 Rules, and our vision is um, to accelerate Drupal 8 uptake by ensuring that the rules module as a key contributed module is available for everybody so that people can build flexible workflows on their websites. And we also want to find a way to make our contributions, like all the development time that we put into the rules module, a bit more sustainable. So um, that sounds like funding, right? Um, and on Drupal Funders, we put up a campaign, and we kind of uh, were really successful. We had over 300 people pitch in uh, smaller and bigger amounts of money. 
And we also had a lot of corporate uh, companies um, supporting us, which is really great. So thanks a lot to all of them. Together, uh, we, got a <clears throat> we got a financing about 18,000 euros. And that translates to 45 euro um, self-cost of either Epico or Tronomics, the both companies employing Klausi and Fargo. So they would, they would allow their developers to work for the self-cost. And in Austria, it's basically for 45 euros. Um, you don't earn anything, but you kind of let the people work on, on contribution in that sense. So um, that's really great. I, it was, was kind of a cool accomplishment for us. And it, it enabled Klausi and Fargo to, to invest more time um, in order to, to work on all, all the topics that we have stated. Um, that was over a year ago. And until now, we actually finished the first milestone. There's a, there's a more detailed blog post on our website, d8rules.org, uh, where we explain what we have accomplished so far. And we did a lot of um, interesting stuff on the way. Um, yeah. Like to have an overview, so the milestone one is kind of the basics of the rules core engine. Um, the plugin types are all there. Um, you have the condition and action APIs. We actually already have ev event uh, APIs as well, so we, are, we also started working on stuff that was planned further ahead. And yeah, the parameter configuration and the context mapping. And basically, all that together, milestone one, <clears throat> is what we call a developer preview. So if you are interested in porting a contribution module uh, um, from Drupal 7 to Drupal 8 that relies on, Drupal, uh, on the rules module, that has integrations, its own custom events, its own actions, its own conditions, you can al already start doing that by now. Um, that's cool. And then, thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, milestone two, we reprioritized a bit. So originally, we only had the UI put at the very end, but we felt without the UI, it's, it's, it's really boring and nobody will, will want to use it. Um, so we reshuffled priorities a bit, and we already have very basic steps of the UI in place, um, but we need, definitely need a lot of help there. And in order to be able to complete milestone two by the end of the year, um, we would do... Um, yeah, like the UI part one, so that you can do the basic editing. Um, and then we'll do, yeah, we kind of complete all the engine features. Um, we'll also have the advanced um, plugins, like finalizing the events, or we still have to implement the loops and so forth. Um, we'll have entity token support, um, the configuration CMI integration that's already started. Um, so there's already examples for that. Um, then all the rules, the generic rules integration, so that data is uh, <clears throat> exposed, um, and the reusable UI components. And then finally, at the end, uh, we have a lot of like advanced tasks to finish, and we're gonna complete the rules UI. We're gonna have the rules scheduler ported, and the existing integrations, which also has already been started. So a lot of work has already been started. A lot of work is ahead. Um, I think we have a good plan. And we have actually a much, much bigger team than I presented in the beginning. So during sprints, trainings, and sessions, we didn't only work on the module itself, but we also trained a lot of contributors, a lot of members on the new paradigms of Drupal 8, getting up to speed uh, with, with the plugin system, getting up to speed with the context API. So that was a really great opportunity, and we we have held uh, sprints, trainings, and sessions at various Drupal camps, Drupal cons, um, smaller sprints. So it's really a great opportunity. And this Friday, um, you're all invited to join us as well. Yes. Um, so there's more than 27 contributors that already have their pull requests merged. And there's a lot of more pull requests around. Um, so thank you, everybody, for contributing, it's this, which is awesome. Uh, it really also motivates us a lot um, to push things forward and get, get the module finished. Thank you. Um, yeah, and now Fargo will take over. So if you are interested in helping out, so we really made sure that this 
that is as easy as possible. So basically what you, you need is just a Drupal 8 installation, and then you go to our GitHub page, it's uh, github.com slash fargo slash rules, and there you find the, the readme with all the instructions. So the, the first thing actually that you do is that you fork the, the projects on GitHub and then you move on, but it's everything like written here in the contribution guideline, so it's uh, quite easy. So as you see, we decided to, to use GitHub for um, contributing uh, to rules and for working uh, uh, in, for working on the Drupal 8 port because uh, the pull request and everything makes it uh, be easier for us to, to innovate and uh, work, work faster like in branches than with the patch workflow. Uh, for later, we are not yet sure what, whether we will keep GitHub or move back to the Drupal org issue queue, so that's undecided yet. But for now, Drupal 8 development only is on, is on GitHub. So let's have a closer look at the, the APIs of rules in, in Drupal 8 and let's compare them to Drupal 7. So when you have some, some module that integrates already with Drupal 7, you get an idea on, on how to do the, the same in, in Drupal 8. So basically, always when you want to integrate your module with rules, the first thing to do that you need to do is really describe the data so that uh, rules is able to, to know uh, about the data that you're working with. Like when you have a module that exposes a new entity type, rules needs to know about it, it needs to know about the properties and everything so it can deal with that. So in uh, Drupal 7, basically what you had to do for it is like mostly you had to provide the hook entity property information by the entity, entity API module and then rules worked with that. And in some certain situations, you could also provide a, a new data type. Uh, but basically, that's like the fundamental thing. And once you do that, all the generic actions and conditions of the rules module, like the data comparisons at the data value, or also the, the entity actions and conditions, then uh, automatically work based upon that. So that's really the, the first thing to do. And in, in Drupal 8, uh, fortunately, there's a new API, the type data API which we uh, managed to get into core, uh, which is really the, the crucial thing that uh, we are building up. So um, what's nice about it is basically that it's all in core and once you follow the things that core uh, already has, you basically are, are, are set. So to give you a short overview about what it is and to get an idea, so the type data API basically is a, a consistent way of interacting with any data based on your metadata. So it, it allows you um, to uh, deal with entities and data in a, in a generic fashion. So basically it works up a, a type system that's defined in PHP. So it uh, comes with some uh, very basic primitive types like string, integer, float, and so on. Then it also defines something we call like complex data type. It's basically a complex type is some data structure with uh, some named properties in it and then it also has the notion of lists where lists are basically multiple values of, of some data type. So this is an overview of all the data types that are already in Drupal 8 core. So as, as mentioned there are all the basic things like string integer but there are also some, some more special things like timestamp, email, that's all already in core and you can just use it also with, with the rules module when you describe your data. And the same way there's an, like automatic types for entities like entity node. So in Drupal 7, the, the type for node was just node. In Drupal 8, it's always entity column node, entity column entity type. So that's a, a little change, but it also makes sure there can't be any namespace collisions. And uh, similarly, we also have automatic uh, data types for every field type that's defined in a system. It's just field item, column, field type name. So like the text field type would be field item, column, text. So this is um, an example on how you provide a new data type in, in case you really need that. Like mostly I think you, you are good with the defined data types, but for you to, to get an idea, like a data type in Drupal 8 is just a plugin, so you can also extend and, and add your own special data types. Like if you would, you could add a, a float that's just as, of a certain range as, as a separate data type. And basically, what uh, as this is a float, it's a primitive, so it extends primitive base, but also makes sure it's extending like primitive interface. It's all based up on interfaces and uh, really reusable. 
this is another example for implementing a field type. Um, as mentioned, uh, there's the notion of complex data. So field items are complex data because they contain multiple properties. Uh, so if you think of like the, the link field, it contains, like the example here, it contains the URL. And when you implement the field type, you just define the properties that your, your field item is going to uh, contain. You have to do that for implementing the field type. And that's the same information that rules is going to make use of as well. So to sum it up, to, for describing um, data to rules in Drupal 8, basically you just need to, to implement the core APIs, follow the type data API, and there are also some, some hooks you can use in addition to like what you have seen, there are some like hooks for defining code fields, but basically if you use the configurable fields, it's known to, to rules by the, on its own. If you implement the field type, it's known. Um, yeah, so that's really the good news in that direction. Like everything you do in, in Drupal 8 core with your content entities automatically works with rules as well. There's no extra work needed in that uh, regard anymore. Yeah, so Glossy will explain how to write conditioned action plugins and some events. Exactly. So um, for rules in Drupal 8, um, the interesting parts, of course, for the contrib developers like you, you're writing your custom module. How do you integrate with rules? Of course, with the building blocks that itself the engine uses and that are conditions, actions, and events. And if you look at that, what are we doing in Drupal 8 rules, what everybody is doing in Drupal 8, and that is using plugins. So I guess you heard this already a lot at this conference. So we, we saw the plugin system right now when Fargo is playing type data. You basically probably saw it in some other session already. And this is the go-to API to specify things of a certain type. Like you specify actions that, are, that fulfill some interface. This is done via the plugin system. This is completely object-oriented. It's... Not a very complex system. You basically have a manager that creates the plugin instances for you, and you have some way of, of discoverability so that you place your class somewhere in the file system in your module, and then it gets found, and then it gets into this plugin system for this type. Um, most of the time, this is done via annotations. Annotations are special comments um, on um, PHP classes. We already saw that in, on the type, uh, type data example that Fargo gave. Um, where you leave the plugin ID, some label, or other definitions that this plugin type brings. And by putting in a special location in some plugin folder, for example, in a contrib module, it gets recognized by the system, and then it's available for use in the system. So um, in, this, in this case, Roos, for example, can build a select box where you select the action. It just uh, asks the action manager, give me all actions that any module defines, and then people can select it in the UI. Um, yeah, I already told you about discoverability. This works by just putting the, the class in a specific place. And there are also derivatives of uh, plugins. So, for example, you have the entity save action. And in the user interface, it's confusing to have entity save. End users don't know what does that mean. So you want to expose that for any entity type. So you can create virtual plugins, so to say, where you have an that action for node saving, for user saving, for taxonomy term saving, and then you can put it in that group, in a node group, for example. Although the code base behind it is just one plugin, but it, it poses as multiple plugins in the system. And that's really just Drupal core features. Rules is just leveraging that, and it's really powerful. And you will see that everywhere in Drupal core. So plugins are entity types of plugins, data types are plugins, um, views um, uses plugins. Basically, every module in Drupal 8 will use plugins. So I guess the first thing you will learn about Drupal 8 is how to use plugins, really. So providing conditions, how we do that. Um, in Drupal 7, we had this hook, hook rules condition info, and basically in there you had an array which would specify the name of the condition and what parameter it takes and um, the callbacks which should be used. And the replacement for that um, in Drupal 8 is implementing a condition plugin. Um, let's look uh, at the code, how that looks like. So... Ah, uh, yeah, laser point is here. This is basically the annotation uh, which I was talking about. We already saw that. It's this um, add character with some plugin name. In this case, it's just the core condition plugin type. And there we describe all the, the, the stuff that is statically available, like the ID, the label, and whatever. Um, yeah, you can also leave other commands up here, so it's not really complicated to do. And for simple conditions like um, this condition for nodes, um, we just have to implement the evaluate method and what we try to check here, if the, the node is sticky, which means it gets placed on the front page, for example, in some special place. 
So we get the node from context. This is also one important um, concept of um, Drupal 8 and rules um, specifically, um, that any, any context, any parameter this action needs gets set on this object before the evaluate method is invoked. And then we can conveniently access it here and then do something. And we just call the is sticky method in this case and then return true or false. And that's basically it for, for implementing a condition. So uh, this is really a convenient API for any contrib module. It's, it's really uh, fastly written and it's just a class and then you basically are set. So how do we provide actions? So the mirror of the conditions API is the actions API and that has to have the hook action info in Drupal 7. Same principle, you specify, specify an array with all your action that you want to define and actions look basically the same in Drupal 8. It's one plugin class. You put it under the plugin slash a rules action folder in your um, contributed module directory. Rules itself also um, provides this action. So uh, this code example is taken from the rules module itself. So rules provides the engine to run all this action and condition system, but it also provides the most common actions for core, for example. In this case, deleting an entity is a common task. Rules um, implements that itself. And again, it's just a simple interface which specify that the plugin has to implement the execute method. And same system here, we have some context where we pull the entity from, and then we just call delete on it. So um, any action or the condition plugins that you will see in Drupal 8 will be fairly simple. They just call some other API that is generally available, and that's how they integrate with rules itself. Um, yeah, you can see some other stuff in the annotation, like um, this stuff is translatable, so when you have the, um, your, your site in Italian, for example, um, the annotation reader reads that and translates it for you, so you can even have Italian labels in the rules UI. This is also just basic principle from the plugin system in Drupal 8 that we can leverage here. Uh, providing events, this is a bit different. Events are also plugins in Drupal 8, but they use the uh, Symfony event system. So what we had in Drupal 7 was um, an hook, hook uh, rules event info, which specified one array with the stuff in it, same like the other hooks. Um, in Drupal 8, we have Symfony events plus some YAML files where I specify metadata. So in order so that rules knows which events are available so that you can select again from the UI, we have to specify this in a YAML file. Rules itself does that, and the YAML file looks like this. So for example, we want to um, register the um, user login event with rules. So we create this uh, YAML file. This is also part of, of uh, rules itself. Give it a label, and we want to show, um, make it show up under a specific category, and it has some context, and that is exactly the account um, that has just logged in. The type information is important. It says that this is a user object, so that rules knows what fields are available on a user and can make use of that. So this is the first part. So now rules knows about this event. How is this event actually invoked? And it works like this. Um, this is an example um, of rules itself. It implements hook user login. So in Drupal 8, we still have hooks and we have events. Unfortunately, it was not possible in a Drupal development cycle to eliminate all hooks and convert everything to events. So we will have to deal with uh, both cases in Drupal 8. And uh, user login is one example of that. So what rules does in this case, it throws its own event. The first critical part here is that we create our own event class. So this is a very basic class. It doesn't do anything. It just extends the Symfony generic <coughs> event class and passes in the account object so that we can later pull it out and pass it on to rules. And then we just get the event dispatcher, which is a Drupal core service. So we, we just get this event dispatching service and then invoke it with some special name, which is a constant on our event and uh, our event object that we created above. And that's basically it. And then rules will catch this event and then um, look up its configuration. Do we have a rule configured for this event and then invoke it? So for you as a module developer, it's, it's really simple. It's um, you just create this um, event class, pass in all the context information that you specified in a YAML file, and then you're basically done. Rules will handle the execution for you. It's similar as in Drupal 7 where you called um, rules invoke event. Just here you dispatch it um, through the, the event dispatching service. So the great example, uh, the great advantage of this in Drupal 8 is that you are throwing that event not only for rules, so rules can listen to that event and invoke the, um, the rules, but other also contrib modules that just implement Symfony events, Symfony event subscribers can also react to that. 
So actually, this is not a rule-specific integration that you are doing when you are uh, invoking symphony event like this. This is how the event system is supposed to work. So when you write your Drupal 8 contrib modules, you should always use events because hooks are basically deprecated. There might be some edge use cases where they are useful, but anytime you want to ask other modules to give their input, you would invoke invent, and then rules automatically has integration for that. You just have to specify the YAML file that it's known to rules. So Fargo will tell you a little bit about context next. Yeah, so as you have seen, um, for conditions, actions, and events, context is everywhere. So I want to shortly uh, like tell you on how to work with context in general. So first off, when you define a, a new plugin, like a new condition or action, you really need to define also the context that the plugin needs to work with. And the way you do this, as Klaus already mentioned, is uh, with the annotation. You just have like uh, a context key in the annotation, and there you basically fill all the information about the, the context uh, parameters that you need. So in that example, it's like an, the entity delete action. It needs the entity that should be deleted. So the, the entity is the needed context for the, for the action to work. So you basically um, have to provide a name for the context here. So the name is entity. Then you use the context definition class to, to describe the, the context that is needed in a, a little bit closer, where the most important part is actually the data type. In this case it here, it's also entity. As, as shown before, like there's a generic data type entity. So you can specify that here. So rules is, knows it's uh, a generic, uh, some kind of entity that's needed here, so it will work with nodes, users, and so on. Uh, then in addition, of course, there are some, some other keys, label and descriptions, you, you should specify at least, but there are also some additional other keys similar to as it worked in, in Drupal 7 with the, the parameter array definition. So really same concept, but it's just in the, in the annotation. So once you uh, uh, described all the needed context here for a plugin, the next step really, of course, when you need to work with the context somehow. So uh, how uh, you use the context in the plugin is actually um, some a little bit special here in that situation. For actions, we, we made it uh, a little bit easier in that you just have to implement uh, a method called do execute, and it will automatically get all the defined context passed. So as you know it from rules in Drupal 7, just in the same order as you defined the, the contextual parameters, you'll get the, the just passed. So in that example, we had an entity context. So the same way we just put the, the entity as a parameter to the do execute method, it will get passed to the method, and that's it. Another example here uh, is the fetch entity by ad action, which actually not only uh, works with some context, but it also provides context back to, to rules. Like the entity is loaded, is provided back to rules so that sub to rules so that subsequent actions can also work with that entity. And the way you do that is basically that you uh, use the set provided value method on the plugin to just uh, set the entity that you want to provide back. Uh, similarly, like the, the set provided value method, there's also like get context value method for getting context. If you don't wanna like use the notation here, like the context that it's passed here, it's also available via get context value and the, the context name. So that would be an alternative way of do doing it as well. Yeah, and finally, um, passing context to the plugin. Uh, when you like wanna use a plugin that needs context, somehow uh, the context needs to be provided to it. In the case of rules, it's rules doing it, so you don't need to take care of it. But an example given when you want to test your, your conditional action plugin, you can also do that. Uh, so this is an example taken out of the test, actually. It just uh, shows like when you already have instantiated your uh, condition plugin, so it's this condition here, you can just call the method get a set context value to set some context on the plugin. So the first parameter has to be the context name again, and second parameter is just the value for the, for the context. So you call that method for each of the contexts that's uh, required by the plugin, and that's it. Afterwards, you can execute the plugin. Yeah. So let's have a look at configuration. 
Yeah, so now we have configured these nice rules uh, with the rules module. Um, of course, we want to export them. So how do we store configuration in Drupal 8? Of course, we use the config system, which writes everything to YAML files, which is really useful. So if you remember Drupal 7, um, Wolfgang has invented this amazing JSON API with the entity API exports. So basically, it's the same in, in Drupal 8, although it's a, sim a, similar, a simpler format YAML. It's, it's more flexible and easier to read. And yeah, we had the exportables in Drupal 7. Um, and Roots was using basically on its plugin classes um, the methods to, to serialize this, this configuration. But in Drupal 8, it's a bit uh, more simple. We just generate a, a dump array of output, and then the configuration system will um, write it down to disk into YAML files for us. And we also specify uh, a schema for that so that everything is translatable in, in that configuration export. This is all just core features that Roots can leverage. The same features, the same YAML export are used by Fuse, for example, by other configuration things in, in Drupal 8. Um, it's called... Um, uh, configuration entity in Drupal 8 because it's similar to entities but they are not stored in the database but rather in YAML files. I mean they are stored in the database but they are configuration. So it's a bit confusing. And what we have uh, right now in, in Drupal 8 is we have basically two things, two different um, config entities that we are storing. One are reaction rule and the other are components. So components are is just the stuff that you had in Drupal 7 which had no event attached to it but you still can export it and reuse it for whatever purpose. And reaction rules are of course that configuration entities that are uh, configured to trigger when an, an event is fired. And yeah, of course you get all the nice features from, from CMI that you can um, write those th things to disk, commit it to a Git repository. Whenever you change your rule, you will see that in your Git diff, you can commit that again. It makes it really easy to deploy and then synchronize your configuration into your production site. So you don't have to mess around with configuring rules on your production site. Same with in, in Drupal 7. Um, you would just configure it on your development site once you're done and you're sure that the, the rule works, you export it and then you deploy it to your production site. It's kind of like the features module in, in Drupal 7. But yeah, it's not 100% comparable, but it, there will be workflows in, in Drupal 8 that um, support this. There can also be default configuration, which means um, when you install your module, a, a rule is automatically created and also activated. So we had that basically in, in Drupal 7 and it's even easier in Drupal 8. Um, yeah, so we had this hook um, which, had, which had contained PHP code where you could um, use the, the entity API exportables to get your rules or you could use the rules API to configure a rule and then return it. And what we have in, in Drupal 8, as I said, are these um, YAML files and you can easily spot them by, the, by their extension. It's rules.reaction.yaml or rules.component.yaml with the machine name in them. So it's easy to find them, you can grab for them. It, it makes, makes it really easy. And this is what an exported um, rule looks like. It's just basic YAML. Um, so YAML does not have any, any special tags, it's just a key value system. Basically it can be nested with um, indentation or with these brackets. Um, a lot of the stuff like the labels here, this is um, potentially translatable since this is all registered with the configuration schema. And yeah, if you, if you take a look through this, we also see that we have the actions in this configured rules and the condition as well. Um, what context that they have on how the message, for example, for this um, showing a message on the site, we are using just the, the mail of the user in this example, and the user comes from the context um, of this uh, context that is specified on the rule. So even the configuration that we export is very readable and um, easy to maintain. Yeah, back to you, I think, is that your part? Oh, I, I think I do, I do that, right. <laughs> So when we're working with config entities, um, we just load them from the configuration storage by some machine name. Um, out of that, um, we generate, generate the rules expressions. So we call these um, rules expressions that are reaction rules, for example, or rules components that are different kind of expressions. And out of the config entities, using the configuration that we have stored here, the expression object gets uh, instantiated. And then we, before we execute it, we set the context. In this case, it's example, uh, it's important that this rule receives a user object. As we saw, we want to show something on the site, so we need this, this context for this rule to work. And then we just execute it. 
And it's basically all the API you need whenever you want to execute custom rules in your module, whatever you're doing, like Drupal Commerce is a potential candidate for executing rules like this. They will use a, a pattern like this. So back to Josef for UI topics. Yes. So on the previous presentations, we always said there's no UI yet. Um, now we can say there's some steps for the UI already. So what really got me excited um, was a pull request that Klaus created where you can already create an action and start creating a condition and it would already expose all the conditions that are there. And the list is quite big because uh, based on the derivatives concept that we have mentioned, uh, you get actions for creating all the different entity types, updating them, deleting them, and so forth. Um, so we can actually see the fruits of all the contribution work that, that we have received so far, which is cool. Um, there is a meta issue uh, where we basically split down the work that's ha that has to be made. Um, but so far, there's not much available besides listing um, a list of rules components and creating stops for them, uh, but you cannot really edit, you cannot really create actions, conditions uh, within them at the moment. Um, but that can change really quickly. Uh, if we get your help or if we get more funding, um, uh, it would be awesome to make progress uh, now with the UI as all the underlying APIs, as you have seen, uh, are already maturing pretty far. Um, Yes, so what qualifies as contribution? Um, as we are here at this conference together um, talking about open source, about Drupal specifically, um, I kind of felt like it's, it's interesting to see all the different ways that we can collaborate. Um, it's not just about being a developer, being a coder, which is definitely appreciated if you have uh, continuous resources that you want to invest, for example, in helping us out with the rules module. Um, development uh, is definitely highly appreciated, um, but it's also super easy to just convince your boss or uh, any anybody else um, donate money to the initiative. Uh, it's definitely invested in in a good way, in a reusable way. Uh, we try to uh, to really do a good job um, with the, with the initiative. Um, there's a lot of other ways. You can help out writing documentation. Steve Perkis wrote a lot of documentation and Fubi. Um, so there's already some rules uh, documentation available for developers, but along the way we'll need more help there. Um, and in general, promoting the initiative, um, the, yeah, that, that can all help. Um, for us, the main focus now is getting more funding so that we can free up more resources from the main developers because Rules is a really complex topic and we cannot just um, outsource all of the hard problems because um, Fargo and Klaus have years of experience and we kind of, kind of kind of makes most sense to efficiently let them work on it. Um, so yeah, f getting the funding um, up to speed again is, is the main focus point. And then uh, sprinting because um, there are so many of you who, who might be willing to play around with the code to, to get a bit of a feel of the APIs to maybe um, port your contributed modules. Um, so tomorrow um, we'll have a buff around lunch um, where we basically give an introduction on a more personal level where, can where we can also have more of a discussion on uh, how the, the next steps on the roadmap look like, how you can help us or how, um, what you can expect from the initiative over the next month. Um, so definitely come to the BOF at 11.45 tomorrow, Wednesday, room 129. And on Fridays, uh, in the whole um, contribution sprints, we'll have at least one rules table where we can all sit together and uh, work on tickets. There's, there's contributor tasks from very easy to very advanced. Um, for example, Bojan Sivanovic wrote the derivative tests uh, during a conference, which were pretty advanced. Um, people have already started writing integrations for the flag module. Um, people have written a lot of small actions, condition plugins. Um, some people have already started uh, working on, a, yeah, on like logger, logging system integrations. Um, there's a lot of nice ideas, and we, we definitely appreciate all of the contributions. Um, so, yeah. 
Friday is a good day to sprint with us. Um, on the D8 Rules website, you can also see some learning resources, presentation videos, um, and there's a link to find contributor tasks. As mentioned, there's tasks for beginners, there's tasks for advanced people. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, and with that, we're happy to take your questions. And thank you very much. So if you have any questions, there's a microphone on the side. I don't think at that side, so that it's in the recording. Or we can just repeat the question. Anyone porting a module at the moment? Does it have rules integration? Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Um, Can you repeat the question? So first of the, the question is, um, what about the debugging? So like in Drupal 7, it's quite cumbersome to debug the rules, and is there any solution to this? And so the answer is um, that there like, is no like, plan in that we like, directly Im improve the, the debugging capabilities of rules, but actually uh, we, there has already been work to, to integrate like uh, rules with the new uh, Sy Symfony, um, how's it called, the debugger console? Web, web, Dev console. Web, web profiler, yeah. The, like with web profiler to integrate with it, so we'll at least make sure that like all the, the profiling information, and everything, and the rules debugging will integrate with that. Uh, but on top of that, what we uh, would like to experiment uh, with is really like to, to write uh, rules uh, down as, as PHP files. What, uh, what I think would be the, the best way to also ease debugging. So basically the idea is that you uh, configure your, your rules as, as regular, but like just for also increasing performance, uh, like when you, the, the rules are done, they are written to disk as a regular PHP file. And then you could use a regular PHP debugger also to, to debug the rules, what, what I think would be the, the best developing experience. Yeah. Okay, any, any further questions? Otherwise, you can also ask tomorrow at our bar. I think it's at 12. Do you know the room? Well, I think we had the room. We just had it. Yeah, you can find the room number on our website. Um, and thank you again. Okay. Thanks.